live chat. Hello, and we're live. Right, there we go. Thank you very much for joining us, folks. It's a cold and stormy night here again, as usual. Um, and that's the, uh, we've just gone through our episode on Paul, um, sorry, Paul Atreides. So, um, yeah, this, this, that's our longest episode. And um, we, we, we don't quite fully go all the way with Paul because we, we look a little bit with him, Adam, with the next episode on Leto the Second. Um, and that will have our conclusions in the next episode as well as we finish our run at looking at the hero and um, Frank's major major theme of the dangerous hero and particularly the messianic impulse that overtakes the, the masses periodically and the control systems that develop around such an individual. So I hope you've enjoyed that one. Um, it's nice to have these videos remastered, by the way, with the, with the sound fix so i know as much as i had warning loud music ahead kind of thing on a few of them that's all gone everything's fixed okay and it, it um, makes for a much happier uh, viewing and listening experience i hope so as usual folks um hopefully you can all hear me okay but if somebody could give me a wee yeah we can hear you that would be great um, um if you have any questions at all on paul atreides or um the theme of the hero or in, in particular anything to do with the episode tonight or all things June or all things science fiction, basically, please fire away. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll have a wee bit of a chat. That's, it's a very long episode. And we do have a look at Paul through the three books there, um, through June, June Messiah and Children of June. And in terms of his following Lord Raglan's pattern, he doesn't, he doesn't have that mysterious sort of death atop a hill kind of thing. I think he's, he's just sort of stabbed, you know, and it's kind of a, um, I don't know, it's quite a, quite an odd death, I think. Um, but otherwise, we get to see the full pattern through the books, really, of Lord Raglan's 22 ritualistic steps that the hero goes through and um, Joseph Campbell's uh, stages of the monument. What have we got here? Sorry, that's my dog coming. <laughs> Hello, Noodles. What are you doing? He's going to be here, of course. There we go. So, uh, there we go. It's a chilly Sunday here. And um, mm. so it's quite a lengthy video. Um, it's the biggest of all 36, I think. And um, yeah, a good detailed look at Paul Atreides. I hope you've enjoyed it, by the way. And, um, or, you know, or, uh, it's a, there's a lot of information and it takes us through. Um, the three books, as I said, um, and we get a, we get this inversion of themes with the hero. And if we've made it past June, uh, although as, as I always like to point out, there are a couple of indicators in June that Paul's not the hero you think he is. Um, but if we get past June, then we've got past Herbert's trick. And as we find out quite early on in June Messiah, um, that uh, Paul is has committed genocide. Um, on a scale beyond anything that that, that uh, I suppose that we can recognise, um, the numbers are in the billions and multiple planets and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, it is quite a shocking moment, I think. When I, when I first read that, um, you know, um, I thought, oh, um, and as I said to you, I think I said to you before, I recognise the kind of overlay of the Atreides myths, um, uh, what we would call the myths of the Peliped line. Um, over Paul's family, and so the the indicator to me is actually when Leto was Leto, uh, excuse me, Leto the second, the infant Leto the second is is kind of left to die with the the kind of final battle in June, and um, is very indicative of um, what's called the sacrifice at Alice, um, which is fundamentally to do with um, Agamemnon, who's who is one of the Atreides. Um, so that's that's the indicator in June, but at this point when we get into June Messiah, the full the full realization of what Frank Herbert's doing kind of starts to hit us, I think. Um, and if we're astute enough, we should be going, "Wow, hang on a minute! That the hero is killing billions, he's sterilizing planets. What what's going on?" I you know, and uh, we get this comparison of uh, Paul Atreides to to Hitler and Genghis Khan based on the number of people that they've killed. And we kind of just viewed as statistics, I think, as, as it's pointed out. And Paul indicates to Stilgar that he, he rules in the same way these individuals did through his legions. And um, I think we've had a wee bit of a chat before about 
how the Roman Empire worked and how its legions operated, but more importantly, that uh, how, how the Roman Empire tended to conquer was kind of through what you would call the interpretatio romana, which is kind of a religious foreign policy. Um, and it's, it's about religious assimilation kind of thing. So, uh, as I said, the, the Romans don't really want to fight everybody. They kind of want to pop in, tax the place, and, and you know, without too much bother. So it's it's quite interesting. Um, the other, I think we pointed out a couple of days ago, um, or the other night, I think somebody was saying about, asked the question about, is, is Paul uh, based on Hitler? Uh, and he is to a degree based on Hitler. But the point we were actually making is that he actually has the memories, the, the personality of Hitler and Genghis Khan are both part of the male other memory. And so the, um, as we get later on to the God Emperor of June, we, we see the God Emperor has a kind of pick and choose of who's in his other memory and, and brings forth the um, the personality that Frank calls Harum, which is the uh, Khufu, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh Khufu, which is, uh, I think the Greeks know him as Cheops. Uh, you would spell that with a, if you want to search under that, it'd be C-H-E-O-P-S, if you like. Um, and he sees this this individual as being the most brutal kind of of all of these dictators. So we get this comparison with Paul and uh, you know Hitler and um, Genghis Khan, and we really we should at this point go, oh no, this is this guy's not a, not a hero. This guy's a monster. Um, but we we do, but but we read on, don't we? <laughs> if you see what I mean. And there's there's a justification provided for it, which is unusual. And I think part of that is to keep keep the author invested in Paul Atreides as a hero, if you see what I mean, because the whole Frank's whole point about this is we're caught up in it. Um, the ordinary people are caught up with such individuals, support them, you know, and um, because they're, in a sense, seen in an amplified way by the general population, what they do, the, the disasters that they can make, the mistakes that they can make are amplified greatly. Um, so, yeah, Paul Atreides is um, both a response to the kind of, what you might call it, the, 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 I suppose the traditional kind of hero. Uh, I'd, I'd argue that kind of hero from the classical work, um, the mythological hero. And he's also a response to a certain type of superhuman, um, ubermensch type character that's appearing in, in science fiction at the time. Um, and what what the um, science fiction academics would call the the Van Vottian hero. So um, and the main the main focus for that, as we say, is um, A. Van Vott's novel Slam, um, which I've got sitting back there somewhere. I think um, do, 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 there it is. So <clears throat> let me just put some books aside. There we go. So A. Van Vott's quite writes quite decent books. Don't get me wrong, but this this is the book that. Um, in a sense, what we call the Van Vautian hero, this is the book that the character is called Johnny Cross. Um, and I think this is 1940, around then. Let me just quickly check. Um, and it probably had a magazine publication prior to that. Oh, but, um, but, um, oh maybe it's... Yeah, I think, no, I've just got British ones in this paperback, but they're, they don't they don't line up with the dates there. But um, that's that's and, um, Slans, a super race capable of mind-reading and equipped with bodies many times more resistant to fatigue than ordinary mortals, but they live in constant fear of discovery, for the rewards are great if anyone should capture a slam, dead or alive. Johnny Cross was their only hope. He alone had the secret of his father's invention. He alone was capable of proving that the slam's knowledge could benefit mankind. Slam is a science fiction classic by, by A. E. Van Vogt. So I do reckon, if you haven't read this, by the way, um, it fits very well into this kind of body of literature if you like that we've, we've talked about floats around both behind chronologically behind june and in front of it if you see what i mean that's another one a van Vogt's destination universe um and i think i think his book generally his books are called the null a universe some of these books um but there we go so that's that's who paul atreides is um kind of a response to we get to see a lot of these types of characters and um, there, I suppose it's probably, we, we talk about, about about this, it's to do with um, the arrival of Superman, <clears throat> kind of in the late 30s and stuff. And things, you know, um, certain cultural tropes inform others, if you like. Um, 
and we often get a sort of response. You know, so we get a Buck Rogers, then we get a Flash Gordon kind of thing. You know, cash in in some ways. Um, so yeah, so we have this 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 Paul Atreides, and um, we're tricked. We, we're sort of all of, almost all of June is a trick upon the reader. June Messiah starts to educate us really on the nature of the power around such an individual, what they can do and the harm that they can do. And we have the golden path. We understand why Paul's doing it. And th this is the real trick with Paul Atreides, I think. Um, we should not like this person in the end. We, you know, we should not like this kind of hero at all. We should not be sympathetic to him. But Frank Herbert's writing, whatever it is that he does, makes this guy sympathetic to us, even though we understand what he's doing. And the fact, it's where does our sympathies lie and why, I suppose. And we have to do a wee bit of self-reflection with um, with Paul Atreides as a, a character. So, um, yeah. Could somebody, if anybody's listening, could somebody, I've sit and done a lot of chatting here, but um, could somebody give us a wee thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Because um, I didn't get a wee response to that. And if anybody's got any questions or answers for me, fire them away. And um. I suppose one of the things you could think about is what's it feel like to be to be tricked by Frank Herbert? Um, you know, that, that we, we have such a well-set-up hero that we, we absolutely root for and admire him. Um, thank you, Rand Domity. Uh, excellent. Thanks very much. Just thought, I wonder if I'm talking to a screen here. <laughs> um, so there's so much to say about Paul Atreides. But, yeah, um, wh why do we admire him? And then... So we, we, we take this, we follow him on the heroic journey. And yeah, things work. Yeah, we get our satisfied. Everything works out for the hero, kind of what we want in a proper hero. And then we take this this little book in between all these quite chunky books, June Messiah. And um, we get this full inversion of theme. We we have a realization moment that this guy's, whoa, you know, a, a big time killer. Uh, and arguably a very destructive force to humanity. And his his rationale for doing it is the golden path, that he can see um, a future for mankind that is um, a, a crisis point, basically where if we if he doesn't do what he's doing, nobody will sur survive. And that, that's a hell of a choice to make, isn't it? Uh, so that's the thing. We realise the difficulty of walking the golden path as he puts it and um we 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 can justify all of these deaths because of this event what becomes harder for us to deal with is the fact that paul stops and turns away from it all um randomity just says um sorry to pick up on randomity's comment here but it seems like paul has no control over the jihad He's helpless against his fate. Yeah, and um, that's that's how that's presented to us, to Paul. And as I said, Rand Dominic, it's it's he's trying to do it. There's a there's a moral reason for it. We we have at you know it's either do something really bad, um, and every you know somehow some people will come out of that alive, or do nothing and and it'll still it's kind of presented that it's going to still happen anyway. I think, isn't it? As you say, he's helpless against his fate. And um, this is one of the links of, of, I think, of Paul Atreides to uh, Oedipus in particular, as Oedipus also ends up blind. And um, as I think we talked about the other day, how a lot of, um, shall we just say, that the, the psychological world and the, the world of psychoanalysis gets the Oedipus myth badly wrong. Um, and the, the the thing about Oedipus, if if you understand the myth, is that he he actually does have he is cognitive of what's going on, and um, um, the gods are too. But simply put, the fates, if you see what I mean, um, and we have a represent. I think that we have an image of the fates, the Greek fates of the Morai, and um, oh, excuse me, we say I click that off. Uh, oh goodness, what are their names? Clotho. Oh, Atropos, is it, or something like that, and Clathesis, I'm getting that badly wrong. Um, Macbeth is also trapped by the predictions from the sisters, yet yeah, Randomity, they're, they're the same three sisters in Macbeth. So um, 
in 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 Greek mythology, one of the, is it, it's about spinning a thread for a person's life. If you see what I mean, one of them kind of spins the thread. One of them determines how long it is, and the other one cuts it. And these th so the so the thing with Oedipus, in sense of um, what happens within the Oedipus myths, is that the gods are, you know, it's not Oedipus is blameless really, and the gods wish that they could. That's it. It's about it's fatalistic it's it's he's doomed and nobody can can help him but it's um and there are a lot of hero cults to oedipus in in the ancient world and there'll be a, a hero cult at athens and i think uh, colonus is it um and he's of course he's a theban king but um it's 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 the admiration of that steadfastness and walking towards your doom i think that there's something noble about oedipus in his doom and but uh, that's the thing everyone's sympathetic if you see what i mean and we're like that with paul and and the similarities of you know the blindness etc and the sympathy that we have for paul i think we talk about a lot of these uh greek myths overlaid on top of the atreides and in particular raglan structure which which brian herbert talks about specifically his father uses this the the raglan structure is based he takes the oedipus myth and that's his system and it's um, so all of the, if you think about Oedipus scores twenty two on Raglan's system, it's because the system's built around Oedipus, um, and therefore you know he's your he's your subject zero if you like, and that's the way Raglan's. And if if you were following Raglan's myth, uh, sorry, twenty two ritualistic steps of the hero, which which Paul the Treaties does and fulfills nineteen of them, um, I think Oedipus is an obvious template for the hero here. Um, the thing about the, the, the Atreides overlay on on um, Paul's family, and as I said, we're doing a wee video, we're working on a wee video with that at the minute. We're going to look at the, the Pelopid line um, and the myths around that family genealogy from Greek mythology and how they're overlaid into Dune. Um, but particularly the, the sacrifice of Leto II is to do with that. But um, so the, the thing is that Paul Atreides, by the way, uh, whenever we say that the, the name Atreides, Ah, how would we? How could we apply it really? In terms of individuals like Agamemnon and Menelaus, it's not. We're not applying those personalities. Um, you could probably say that Leto the First is a bit like maybe Agamemnon, but he's not really at all. But just in terms of being a war leader, but um, the, the, I put it this way: the characteristics of these men are not on Paul. What what's to is to do with the sort of set of myths around the family? So there's a hint more of Orestes and Paul Atreides. Uh, but it's it's more more to do with the cyclical and repetitive nature of curses, if you see what I mean. Um, let me just catch up with it. But um, yeah, so that it's about fate, and as I said, we have that. That's also one of those aspects within um, the triple goddess figure, if you know what I mean, uh, is an interesting aspect. And hmm, the the fates are very much. Um, a part of that. There's a rather good picture of the fates. I think it's in it's in one of the title cards for these episodes. But I think it, you might have seen it in, when we were looking at the themes of the hero. And I, I'm not sure who the artist is, but it's a cracking picture of the of the Morai, and it's um it's a pre-Raphaelite painting. But uh, I must have a look at it. <coughs> figure out. Excuse me. Figure out who did it there. Um, let's have a wee look. We're freezing here tonight. Our heat. We've run, our heating's not working. We're getting it fixed tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Seems like Paul has no control of Mike Bella. So uh, Brad says, you say we shouldn't like him, but uh, and this may just be me. I like Alex DeLarge from A Clockwork Orange. Okay, yeah. Um, Alex Alex DeLarge uh, from A Clockwork Orange is Mr. Alexander as well. They're the same person. Um, Brad, uh, I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I love A Clockwork Orange. Alex DeLarge, um, your sympathy is developed by what's done to him through the system. And um, it's to do with two philosophies. One's called Augustianism, the other one's Pelagianism. And um, it's a lot to do with what Anthony Burgess, who taught young men, you know, um, what he thought about how young men grew up in terms of sort of punishing it. The idea is that um, one set would sort of argue that, you know, given time, people kind of become good. Uh, you know, in your youth, you're stupid, you do silly things. But... Uh, I mean, Alex Dodge is a wee bit beyond that, but um, the other argument is that no, we can, we'll make you good. And that's hence 
hence the clockwork orange, if you see what I mean. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, what happens to Alex the Large is very slightly different at the end of the book than it is in the film. <coughs> and he is redeemed, isn't he? But, um, but it's more about what's done to him, I think. Um, but yeah, the, the, the guy that he beats up at the, and they, they uh, rape and kill his wife at the beginning, Mr. Alexander, who wants revenge, is meant to be him as an old man. Um, and that's Alex the Large and Mr. Al I think it's Mr. Alexander he's called in the book. Um, but yeah, yeah, you do. Um, I don't know. There's there there is something sympathetic about Alex Delarge. Uh, I don't know. He's he's a bit more obnoxious, I think, in the book. But but it's it's probably uh, the film he's played a certain way, I think. But um, but yeah, you have sympathy for him because of what's done to him, I suppose. Uh, Lily says he realizes that the forces he sets in motion could destroy the empire, and his refusal to commit to the golden path put him on a dead end road. But doing nothing would be worse. Uh, is the problem prescient, says Randomity itself. Uh, sorry, Randomity says, is the problem prescient itself? This is what leads to stagnation and the eventual dead end of, end of the human race. Um, could be Randomity. Um, I must bring up what your idea about Leader of the Second again. Later on, I'll, I'll run through a wee bit of this stuff and try and keep my head on this bit of a thread. But it was a really good idea, Randomity. I really liked it. Um, let me see. So, Lily... Uh, that's it so yeah but what what i have a sort of point about the golden path is i think it's different for everybody who has one if you see what i mean whenever paul turned ceases it his golden path ends really and whenever sorry whenever leto the second takes up the mantle a new golden path begins and i think personally i think that the golden path works on a number of different levels but so it, it is his excuse but he turns away from it and we have to ask why didn't he foresee that if you see what i mean um based on what they tell you in the book about what what happened i don't know i think there's ways of presenting preventing what they see but we don't know if, if what they see is set in stone i suppose we're, we're, we're running with what we're told about prescience and we, we get certain things but it's not perfect i think for anyone Cl the, the closest person it's perfect for is the god ember i think <coughs> excuse me um, so and well, the whole point about randomity, what you're saying. So sorry, quickly, Lily, I just cut back. <laughs> what I'm saying is, why doesn't he just if he's if he turns away from it, why does he kill all those people in the first place? And that's another thing that we have to question. So if is because at that point he's done it all for nothing. Um, if you see what I mean. So, but you know, again, he's, there's something noble about him. And he's trying to kind of undo what, what's happened in some sense. And again, we have to ask, why didn't he foresee all this? You know, pardon me. But it's, yeah, it seems really like a road to hell. Pardon me, sorry, I'm a bit burpy tonight, folks. As paved to, um, oh, sorry, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But that's part of why we can't lose um, sympathy for him, Lily, I think. What randomity is saying there is the problem prescience itself. We know that there's limited prescience within it, and it, it works to a degree within the Dune universe. And we do know that the whole point of the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, that the point of the Kwisatz Satterach is it's meant to be a weapon wielded by them that will renew the human race by war. And you get the sense that the, it's, it's a kind of all, and the Bene Gesserit want to stand behind that weapon as they wield it, if you see what I mean. Um, so... And of course, that evolutionary leap focuses on prescience and other memory. So it's quite possible, um, randomly, that it's, it's the whole stagnant nature of prescience that needs kickstarting, if you see what I mean, if that's where evolution is going. And we kind of do know that evolution is going that way later on because we get naturally born reverend mothers and stuff like that. So it's a good point. Uh, Dean says, sorry I'm late, missed the video, what was the theme? Uh, Dean, tonight it was all Paul Atreides right, right the way through and focusing on um, the hero, uh, Herbert's warning about the hero and the systems of power that develop around him. Uh, are you aware of the Scarface effect? Oh, sorry, that's just somebody else. Don't know what that is anyway. <laughs> Alex the Large, Alexander the Great. Mm. I, um. A Clockwork Orange book, the book is written in a structure similar to a piece of music. It, it, there's a, it's a really good book. It works on all sorts of levels. 
a lot of people are put off the book by the film. Um, if you haven't read the book out and or are put off by it based on the movie or anything to do like that, I highly recommend you read the book. Um, it's very, very good. Mm. It has a there's more more to it, I think. But uh, yeah, Clockwork Orange, Anthony Burgess. Um, I do believe. So, oh no, I'll not go there. <laughs> One wee second, just to catch up, folks. Um, Uh, Gamer Two Chan says, "Could Paul have stopped the jihad if he didn't become Muadib?" Karen says, "Hello there, hi Karen." Uh, I thought it was Anthony Burgess. What did I say? Did I say something else? Anthony Burgess is the author of the Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Um, I wonder what I said. Oh, <laughs> let me see. Um, could Paul have stopped the jihad if he had didn't become Muadib? I think so, but I think he would have had to have killed his himself, his mother, and Alia to do it. Uh, if that makes sense, um, because you can see that even if you oh it's the mother taking it's Jessica taking the jihad forward in his usually in his alternate alternate um, threads of the golden path. I think that's the point in the book where he says my mother is my enemy, where he realizes no matter what he does she'll carry it on. So I think my point was yeah I think he I don't think anybody's maybe suggested that before, but I think if he killed himself, Alia and his mother. I think then the jihad could probably be prevented. <laughs> Bit harsh. <laughs> Just an idea. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, sorry, if I give out the wrong name for Clockwork Orange, it's Anthony Burgess. Uh, Clockwork Orange, yeah. Do, do, do. Dean McKenna says, Anthony Burgess has also wrote, um, you'll see it in, uh, in uh, the videos. Is it there? There we go. If you're, if many people aren't aware of this, it's 1985. Uh, so if you know you're 1984, it's worth getting this and having a wee look at it. It's a set. It's it's um, do do do. It's really sort of like a set of uh, ideas and essays and stuff. You find stuff on Kakatopia in there, by the way, which is quite good. And it's worth a look at. Um, so there we go. Yeah, Anthony Burgess, great. Uh, a friend, all right, Dean says, a friend of me argued a lot about Leto and a fourth dimensional trolley problem. The idea being that Leto is utilitarian and causes pain now for the future of humanity. I told him about your idea of the, or all right, dot, dot, dot. The golden path is an excuse, a oh, for example, based on the thousand year Reich. Um, Right, Dean. Yeah, I th you see, based on what Her Herbert is warning us about, we have different trappings around heroes and so on. So the systems of power, the hero themselves, there's also has to be a vision, if you see what I mean. And if we took, for example, if we applied what we know about Paul Atreides, what Frank Herbert's trying to do to, say, someone like Hitler, then his, his idea for his vision... If you want to call it that, the, was it? Remember who said that? Was it uh, George Bush, Senior? The vision thing, I think. The vision thing. The vision. Um, that would be Hitler's idea of a thousand year Reich. That's his golden path, and of course it dies with Hitler. If you see what I mean. And Hit, if if we understand Hitler, Hitler's Hitler's a nut, but Hitler's um, Hitler's very much about goes about using and abusing mythology. Um, very badly, and um, it's got, yeah, uh, massive iconotropy within the Third Reich, if you like. But it's it's very it's, whereas iconotropy is the accidental or deliberate mis use of myth. It's very deliberate, I think. Um, and yeah, very very yeah. Uh, to look to look at the Nazis and how they use myth as propaganda is a real real eye opener to understanding the Nazis. Um, and the ideology that come, you know, all of it, it's, it's a bit bonkers, but it's, it's, it's a perversion of a lot of it's a perversion of myth and, uh, propaganda myth is propaganda. And this is exactly what the Atreides do, by the way, folks, as we, as we well know, and as somebody pointed out, you know, the other day, nobody does propaganda better than Leto Atreides. Nobody in the whole empire does it better than him. And uh, as we talked about, almost everybody within the Atreides household are, are dab hands at um, dab hands at the propaganda. 
So there you go. I wonder what, what did they think of your uh, of the response team? I wonder. Um, mm. But yeah, the, and the whole the whole idea, as I said, again, you know, what if what if what if Kralizek never happens? Um, and the idea of a mythical battle, they they push myth heavy the Atreides. It's quite possible that Kralizek's not real, <laughs> you know, if you see what I mean. And the, the Bene Gesserit very much understand that. And if we under, if we, actually what we find in the, in the episode is we understand that the Fremen are manipulated by the Bene Gesserit. They're manipulated by the planetologists. They're manipulated by the Atreides. Um, it's, uh, it's 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 uh, the the manipulation of the Fremen on, works on different levels with with Herbert, if you see what I mean. Um, mythological, ecological, religious, <coughs> military. Hmm. Uh, Rand Dominic says, Paul wasn't a complete quiz at Sadarak as, as his prescience was flawed. There are many examples where his prescience failed. Gurney Halleck and his mother battle with Fade Rutha, etc. Leto was a true quiz at Sadarak. Yeah, there, there are, well, again, that's the whole thing. And we're talking about, it's exactly the point, Rand Dominic, isn't it? And why, so why doesn't he even see the fact that he can see the golden path? He can see him, the jihad in his name. He can... So that must mean he can see the, the 60 odd billion people that they kill and planets that they sterilize. And then it, surely he must see him turning away from the path. Uh, and, and that's where we go, you know, again, we go, what's going on? Ah, because again, we're, we're in the heroic mode with him. And it, 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 I, I, I'm actually having thought about what you guys were saying earlier, how we were thinking about Oedipus. I think there is a level of fatalism and, and doom, accepting the fate, knowing that he can hand, if he does some things in a certain way, he can probably hand it over to his son. But I think it's Leto II is going to, in a way, take it from him. I think it's, it's Leto II sta stepping up to the plate to say, I'll do this. You don't, you can't do what can be done, or what you can't do what must be done. Um, the reason, I, ah, I suppose, there you go. I've just answered the question I think I wanted to know. Why do we still respect and admire Paul at the end, you know? Um, yeah, we, we just, we, ah, we do have our sympathy for him, you know? it's He's trying to do the right thing in a way. And the, ultimately what Leto does that Paul will not is that Paul won't give up his humanity. And because of that, at, by the time we're done with Children of June, I don't know what you think. As much as I analyse the heck out of this stuff, I'm still sympathetic to Paul Atreides. I still, you know, but I've, I, but there's a better taste in your mouth with him. You know, he, he's he's almost science fiction's hero of heroes. He's a comment on heroes heroes of all types in society, but in science fiction as well. So yeah, that I don't know what you think, but I think that's ultimately why we stay sympathetic for him. He, he remains as human, he retains his humanity. And as to what is it we love about Leto II, I mean, there's there's something just the, the joy in something so alien. I think. Sorry, I'm tapping my fingers away there. But um, if you see, I mean, we we do have to ask ourselves the same things about Leto II. He who utterly crushes humanity beyond anything that Paul does. Um, Yet we we all love Leto the Second, don't we? We think he's great. I've I've never heard anybody slag Leto the Second off. Is there anybody who just thinks he's a bit of a you know don't like him at all? I don't know. Let me just catch up with your thoughts, folks. And uh, there's an awful lot to talk about. Fire away with your questions. Um, there's so much really to ask about Paul Atreides. I think that's, as I said, that's why it took an hour on this video. Um, but yeah, I agree, Randall. It's not quite complete. Um, I, does anybody ever have complete presence? That's the thing. Not quite sure. I don't even think Leto the second. But well, he's aware of the no ships, isn't he? By the, their their absence. It's to do with to do with Randall, he was suggesting earlier, folks, that uh, uh, you could have an idea where that it could have been that the Exians when we get to God Emperor of June <coughs> with the Hawaii Nori thing, that it'd be possible that. Uh, so this was Ram Domini's idea. I think it's great. It'd be possible that the Ixians could have offered Leto II when he's in worm form uh, the idea of having a gola of himself, I suppose, I suppose uh, pre-worm, that he could come back 
if you see what I mean. And uh, yeah, that is not an interesting idea. And I, I think I said, but they need cells from before Leto took the worm skin. But I, I was saying that around Dominic, I must mention it earlier. I hope you don't mind. But it was Ram Dominic's idea, and we hear. I, I keep hearing. I think it's, it's like one of those with the the Baron being a, a hermaphrodite. I like these ideas. I think they're great. Thank you very much, Ram Dominic. By the way, um, Dean McKenzie, a brown little bubble, but but always I don't have an objectively horrible kind. Every vision Paul saw. Sorry, but an ob Dean says it's about an audience identifying with an objectively horrible character. Um, every vision Paul saw without the jihad was one where he was dead. Yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of was inspired to write a similar kind of story about a guy who could see all these. Um, uh, yeah, I've actually written this story, but I wrote it thirty years ago, and it's the one that I'm going to try and rewrite. Um, my story is called "The Seven Suits of Erskine D." <laughs> That's a great title. I love it, but uh, I'll not tell you what it's about. But it's about a person who can see all the, all possible futures, but where he's dead, but except one. Um, hmm. <laughs> I still, I kind of re I've written the first paragraph of it. I, I did it for um, just to work with one of my students on a bit of uh, helping them with composition. So I'd rewritten kind of the first paragraph, and I'm quite quite pleased with it. I think I went a bit over the top with the, you know, but I've kept it and I'll maybe start working on it. But there you go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and again, there are points where as, as Paul moves along in time, certain things within the golden path cease to be and, and new new things open up. I'm, I'm just at the point in, the, in June where he's just literally just ridden the worm. And, um, you know, again, how he start, we're starting to get more insight into how he sees things. Um, whereas the previous couple of uh, there's a, it's kind of an intermingle of chapters where we start with Paul and then we go and get a bit of insight into Alia and Jessica and her aunt, and then we go back to Paul and kind of the, the prepping for the worm thing is, is that little it's quite good um, but yeah I, so I think I think the, and how the golden path it's probabilities I think if you think about it it's I, and I think somebody pointed out you have to remember that Paul's a mentat and kind of that if you if as much as um I don't know how the well. I think I've, we've seen kind of the golden path and the clips of the film. I haven't seen the movie, but it looks like just like multiple threads. If you see what I mean. Um, hmm. Yeah. Dean says, yeah, "Sorry, lost my train. I thought there for a wee second. Uh, he conceded he was on the side that Lita was right because his vision was accurate. Uh, oh, you missed a lot of things in his pressings." For example, uh, Duncan attempt on his life at the start of G.O.D., and yet he sees a drad finding his extra spice hoard, even though she has Sonia genes. No, Paul is great because he's cynical of his own mystique, outright rejecting it in the end. Yeah, well, that, that's that at that end part where he has turned away. Yeah, it, it it's an attempt at redemption, isn't it, of some kind, and 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 self sacrifice, I think, and um, sense of fate. So yeah, but that ultimately, if we think about it, then as I said, the word is sympathy. Um, uh, ultimately, you know, we got you know, from pathos is suffering. So we we understand, Paul. We see that he suffered. Um, I, you know, the way he turns away from it, turns to face his fate. I think it's interesting. And of course, the, the literal blindness that he has, but without you know, is um, and again very indicative of of the Oedipus myth. I think. In fact, yeah, in fact, the more I'm starting to think of it, I'm starting to think that there's a lot of Oedipus in overlaid on Paul, particularly in the last book uh, that he appears in. Sorry, in Children of June. Um. Cynical of his own mistake, outright rejecting it in the end. Yeah, yeah that, that that's why is that why you like him? That's what I was saying, Dean. What is it about if that's not the thing? Yeah, that's why you like him. He's cynical of his own mistake, outright rejecting it in the end. Um what well, yeah, why do we why do we admire him? You know, and I think you, you guys maybe have different ideas than me, you know. Um maybe you see different things in, in the hero, but we, we shouldn't, we absolutely shouldn't. And that um if we understand Frank Herbert's intent, it's you know it's an absolute testimony to what he's trying to do in his writing. It's incredible um, that he's so adroit at manipulating the reader and 
revealing enough, keeping the mystery of this character. But he does have his humanity, and that's why we can we can sympathise with it. And we wouldn't want to. I don't know. Would you want to swap places with Paul Atreides? I certainly wouldn't. Rand Dominic says Lido wanted things to happen outside of his presence. That's why he wanted to breed in Atreides, Siona, who couldn't be seen by it. Never thought about the Oedipus connection, but now that you say it, says Dean, made blind of the Messiah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple, whenever we do, we have some of, at the end of Messiah. We do have a few of these paintings, actually, Dean. Um, whenever, we're, if you if you do go through this, again, um, all, of the, all of the images that we've used from kind of the heroic tradition, if you like, that are, a lot of them are um, Renaissance art, or uh, there's a fair amount of pre-Raphaelite stuff there. Um, even pots and things and certain all of it's relevant to what what's being talked about i suppose um all of the images are particular images um so we've got a whole bunch of the uh, really good pictures um uh of key key aspects of the oedipus myth i suppose um but you'll see that that's the blind figure in those episodes that there that's oedipus and um yeah, we have that's part of the Theban trilogy as well. So it's a set of plays that cover those um, myths. And that, that's, I suppose, like Oedipus at Colonus. <coughs> Oedipus, Tyrannus, Antigone, and Oedipus at Colonus is the Theban trilogy by Sophocles. Um, very, very good. Um, it's not on the curriculum in schools here at A level, but what is on the curriculum at schools here at A level is that Seamus Heaney did. Um, did a translation of of the Antigone, uh, Antigone, and it's published as the Burial at Thebes, I believe. Um, so that's that's that version. Heaney's translation of that is is uh, taught in schools here at the minute, at A level. Again, no happy stuff at A. <laughs> there you go. Let me just see. Um, but yeah, no. Um, there, there, there's a range of Greek, a lot of Greek myths overlaid into. Uh, the 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 heroic myths, if you like, overlaid on 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 um, June, um, but especially on Paul, especially on Paul, Paul 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 as a hero. We we talked about this. Why is June so popular all around the world? Paul as a hero appeals to so many different cultures around the world because there's so many heroes in Paul Atreides, if you like, and because you also have what's that kind of sense of monomyth, ritualistic steps. Which is an attempt to one one myth fits all, if you like. Um, it, it's very much constructed that way. I think that that's why Paul is so appealing, you know. Uh, one sixty says, "Appreciate your videos. Thank you very much." One sixty, very kind of you to say so. Uh, welcome to the live stream. If you've got any questions, one one sixty, it's all or anybody else, it's all on Paul Atreides um, tonight, or or all things June and science fiction. Uh, the, the video here in particular look covers Paul right from June all the way to uh, Children of June. Um, there's a wee bit of a hop over into God Emperor just at the And the next episode will be finalising this look at the hero with with Leto II. We've had an episode before on Leto II, but that was looking at him in terms of evolution. The one that's tomorrow night is looking at Leto II as the final iteration of this kind of this kind of hero. Um so there we go. Um, Brad says, oh, look up Planet Dune. It's a knockoff Dune to be released at the same time as the one we are waiting for. Now, alas, I must go. The pubs are open for the first time in almost four months. <laughs> Excellent, Brad. Well, enjoy a pint. Um, yeah, have a good time down at the pub. I will have a look at that. Planet Dune. Yeah, I, I love those. Well, some of them are, uh, I know what you mean, the knockoff movies, if you like. Roger Corman was kind of the master of those. Um Love Roger Corman films, I really do. Um, but yeah, uh, some, I love bad films, so hopefully if it's a knockoff, I wonder how they did it. <laughs> you know, it was good. June's looking like a pretty expensive film. I, I, I wonder is it a knockoff of the David Lynch one? Planet June. <laughs> Planet June looks like a serious copyright violation. I'd rather get your pint. You. <laughs> Excellent. Enjoy your pint. Say hi to your friends at the pub. Be safe. Uh, 160 Planet June and other trailers on the channel are hilarious. I must have a look at it. No, haven't seen it at all. 
Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always like I do like those kind of films. I like the I like the sometimes cheap you know what I mean? Sometimes the cheap imitators, if you see what I mean. Actually, some I'm not gonna this is not gonna happen here, obviously, but sometimes they produce a film that's better than the thing being imitated, if you see what I mean. But uh yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Not go off so good. I'm trying to think, you know, but, but my favorite one kind of ones you know, I don't know if you know Battle Beyond the Stars. I think that's that's a great Roger Corman uh, produced film. I don't, don't think he directed it, but um, it's kind of just a very much Magnificent Seven, Seven Samurai. Just um, I said, even kind of got one of the same actors to play the same sort of role. I think it's just, and it's it's actually really good. And um, I love the Seven Samurai, um, and I love Battle Beyond the Stars, but I do not like the Magnificent Seven. I like the music, dun, you know, dun, 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 but I don't, I'm not a fan of that film. I prefer. I prefer the the superior Seven Samurai, and I, I prefer the inferior uh, Battle of the Planets. But or sorry, Battle Beyond the Stars. But I, th I think Battle Beyond the Stars is such a great, bad, not a bad film at all. Just a B movie if you like. But it's um, it's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> As a little kid, when I've seen it, and I still enjoy. It's just one of those films I enjoy all the time. But I will check out Planet June. Uh, thank you very much, guys. That sounds fun. Other streamers on that channel are hilarious. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, so the, the, the prescience thing doesn't always quite make sense. And um, I think also Leto's, or sorry, Paul's kind of the whole, we always, if we always go back to Samuel Butler's era one, and the very particular passage, a paragraph in that book that talks about the pre erolonians and what happened to them, and what happened to them because they had prescience. And they're all dead within six months. It doesn't say why, but it says that it's because of their own misery. And the suggestion is that they all just that they possibly that they all commit suicide. That's also echo, echoed in in June Messiah, when Sky Tail talks about the Benny Tleilax quiz at Sadarak. Um, and you know they they dance they kind of prance around what they're trying to say, but basically. The, the Blenny Tylax um, quiz at Sadarax commit suicide too. <laughs> Excuse me. So, yeah. Um, and uh, as I said, it's it's one of those things that the Atreides name focuses on a particular set of myths, but um, there are quite a few other myths within within the Dune series itself. Quite a lot, quite a, quite a lot of variation. Um, and I said, one of those, it's one of those things that I think people around the world, why Dune is so popular um, all over the place is that I think almost anybody can read it and see somewhere something of their own culture and one of their myths or an identifier mm. or a linguistic trope or something like that. I think it's very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm still quite enthralled by the whole Dune series. What? I don't know. Where are we at now? Do, 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 15 years after starting <laughs> this kind of thing. Goodness, how time flies. Um, I'll tell you what, guys. One thing, guys. Um, this has been an, an, an amazing test of my memory because I'm not looking stuff up here while I do this. I'm really just um, I'm sitting, kind of watching the videos at the same time with you guys to refresh my memory. If you see what I'm about, I haven't done this kind of work in a, in a long time, except just kind of putting it together as videos. So it's it's good to kind of I'm still still find things. We've you know still find things of interest in June and go ah oh, you know. Dean says, supreme prescience is a narrative problem, though, right? It removes tension. Gaps have to be left in it for that reason alone. Absolutely. And it's an absolute, isn't it? Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. It, it's one of the things I said there are we plot, plot problems with. And if, if you took the logic, I, I'm, I'm a good operator with logic. If you take the idea that and we talked about we can approach the everything that the treaties say or do with myth and propaganda in our on our minds. But if there really is a battle at the end of the universe, what good is prescience right at the very end of the universe? Um, if that's the end of time and stuff like that, and, 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 you know, it raises some interesting scientific and philosophical questions. But we have to we have to run with it. You know, not everything's it's a science fiction book. It's a work of fiction. Our knowledge changes as we go. And presence is a it's it's one of the things that people will say makes it um, a soft science fiction book 
or pushes it into fantasy territory. And I, I disagree as much as there's terminology for stuff within this, but um, I think because certain threads appear, I think I think really is a kind of mathematical probability that Paul works at, similar to what the, the guild navigators do. And because he's a mentat, I think that the go in some ways that the golden path is is a a visualization of the probabilities for him, and it's, it works as a metaphor for for a, a leader's vision, um, as part of Herbert's warning as well. I think, um, but yeah, there we go. June uh, Gamer Two Ten says June is a great series. It teaches you a lot. It really does. Um, Gamer Gamer Two One Zero. And one of the things I was pointing out, if um, we've, we've been doing a good few of these with each episode, I I basically read read the books in different ways. And for example, within that right now, we're having a look at at the June series from a kind of we're going to focus on the heroic warnings and the the warnings about messianism and, and these impulses and so on. But you, then I've read it as a in an ecological manner. Um, I've read it just to get the life cycle of the worm, <laughs> one whole read just to get the life cycle of the worm, um, you know. Uh, and I've read it and, and viewing it at, at, in an evolutionary way. The two the two ways that I didn't get to, and I have read it more. I had a lot of stuff and it simply got lost. It, it was just um, old computer kind of thing I'm lost. If you see what I mean. And uh, I kind of did have that chapter. I've lost the files, but I don't have the paper copies, and they weren't. They were pulled from it. So I also had a political look at it in terms of politics and more. And then I also approached the whole thing again from a gender point of view. And to, those to me were the dominant themes. And, and Frank Herbert says that they're all carefully, carefully intertwined and are difficult to tease apart. And that, that's intentional. And it's the reason why I run with the evolution thread first, because it's the longest one and it's the most dominant thread through all six books. Um, some of the other, the ecology theme doesn't stay strong after the God Emperor, I believe. Um, in, fact, in fact, I'd argue that the, the ecology theme is pretty much dead on its feet by certainly nothing to do with the sixth book. Um, so some things are more relevant within the evolutionary discussion, but the, the hero warnings. And of course, we don't, we never got that last book by Frank. So there were iterations within what he's talking about to happen again, I think. Um, but it's a great series. It teaches you a lot. And I, I'd say to you, Gamer, that you can read it in different ways and learn different things from it. Um, and it's big, <laughs> if you see what I mean. And I'm just rereading June again. So as I said, I'm not too sure. Must be must be read number nine or ten. Um, you, bear in mind that all my other reads of June were all done in very close proximity to each other. So I haven't gone near this book um, in about 10 years, 11 years, because I was... Uh, arguably had read it enough if you see what i mean but i'm really glad that enough time has passed that i can get back to it so it, it's a great series it teaches you a lot it's an interesting thing you could approach whenever you read it you can say to yourself i'm going to read this from an ecological point of view i'm not going to pay to i'm going to read it and enjoy it but i'm going to focus on that theme and see where that takes me in the book and then if you ever want to read it again you know hey the last time i read this and i kind of focused on the going to look at really the criticism of the hero and the political systems and focus on that and then you know read it ecologically could book the books considered an ecological primer as well um so i i absolutely i i've often said it's a book that re, re rewards the reader who returns to it time and time again i think um Ron Domini says note that the Benny Gesserit within the June Tarot and the Spacing Guild were modelling Paul's visions in Messiah. Yes, absolutely. That's really interesting because it's the idea of oracular. Um, it's, it's the idea of the random, isn't it? And we were we were chatting a wee bit about that the other day, randomity. Um, the tar tarot cards, if you like, are simply a random interpretation system. And um, it, was Phil it was Philip K. Dick, the I Ching, another such oracular form of divination um he actually wrote a bunch of his books using I Ching uh and, and it's kind of also in a similar way that Herbert used the, the the Jungian mandalas with his writing and his characterization if you see what I mean fleshing things out <coughs> excuse me so yeah using the Bene Gesserit tarot cards um 
messing with the oracular vision. It's an interesting, it's an interesting strategy of the Bene Gesserit, isn't it? And simply put, if you read someone's, if you give, you know, read someone's fortune, if you see what I mean, there's going to be direction and conversation. Events will occur out of those thoughts. Um, it's like a you know, new mental realities occur. There's a really good story about, um, is it numerology? Pardon me. Um, I think it's an Isaac Asimov story. It's called Spell My Name with an S. Um, <laughs> it's very funny. <coughs> In fact, I, I, possibly, I think if it's Asimov's story, I'd argue it's almost my favorite one of his. I think it was something to do with a conversation that he had with Roger Zelazny about po possibly changing the, the last letter of his name so that his books would be further along on science fiction bookshelves. And I think Roger Zelazny decided no, if, if that's the story I'm thinking of. Um, so Asimov wrote this about what happens if a guy guy goes to see somebody and, and they just, they tell him, it was like an oracle kind of thing, and they tell him to change the letter, first letter of his name, of his surname, and um, it's all the things that ensue and happen afterwards. If you haven't read the story, um, I might be wrong about the author, folks, but it's called Spell My Name with an S. It's very good. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll get some fluids here. My throat's a bit crispy. And I'll just catch up on your conversation, comments and questions. Do, do, do. Hope you're all having a good night tonight or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're at. But isn't it narrative device to... So, ah, let me just catch up. I've run down a little bit. Battle of Arakeen means nothing if you knew Paul is certain of the outcome. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, well, this is the thing we we've always got foreknowledge. It's it's interesting, and, and again, that's what what Herbert gives the reader is something that most most authors would take and absolutely wreck a story with. You know, you kind of give away of it. It, it. it works so well on so many levels. I think I know that's something I say a lot, but it is. It's a it's a very and again, we we can see five years of work in this book in June. Five years. At least five years of work and research on it. It's uh, um, it, it's a very well put together book. I have to say, and it's a clever book, and that's why I did a PhD on it. I, d I didn't want to pick anything simple or um, kind of traditional, or you know, I I just I actually wanted to pick something that was very very difficult. And June just went ping in my head. That's a book to take apart. That's not easy. And has anybody else done it? And the answer at the time was no. Why? Because it's not easy. So there we go. It was the difficulty of the book. Not not that it's a difficult read. It was the you know the, as I would say the complexity, but it's not complicated. Um, and that's what really attracted me to it. You know, because I could have done a PhD on all sorts of things that I'm interested in, and I, I was kind of heading back into the classical world, but I went with that instead. Hmm. Glad I did, I suppose. So Christopher said, hi, Christopher. Christopher says, I like Asimov's Foundation Series presentation of presence, which I think was called Psychohistory. <coughs> yeah. Psycho, Harry Seldon's um, Science of Psychohistory, which means, if, if we break that into English, it means to, the, to inquire into the soul <laughs> is what psychohistory would be. Um, yeah. It's based on a couple of things, isn't it? Looking at history, prediction, mathematical models, and so on. I haven't read um, Foundation in a long time. I'll show you my copy, guys, if you like. Uh, but it's one of those nice wee ones. Oh, it doesn't come down very often, but it's been a long time since I've read it. And I do actually have um, a couple of the other Foundation books that came out. Uh, that's mine there. Uh, that's one of these lovely little things. Hey. Uh, with just the, I just love these are my favorite types. I love books that come in these little boxes. Um, so there you go. And of course, what's really nice, oh, I wonder, can I do this? I've only got two hands, curses, I could do a three. Let me see. There we go. Let me see if I can hold these up for you. The covers go together. Um, so this, I this is all I've read of Foundation. I really enjoyed it. Let me see, am I doing that right? Isn't that great? I think that must be Chris Foss. <laughs> um, lovely books. Um, they're not very big. Um, 
Let's see, about, yeah, about short of a couple of hundred pages each, I think. Um, but they're a very good read. Um, again, it's, I would, I would call this kind of ideas fiction, if you see what I mean. Um, but uh, yeah, voted the, the greatest science fiction series of all time, I believe. Um, no. <laughs> it's it's in, it's um it's not in good company anymore if that's the case if you see what i mean i'd argue that there's a lot better than foundation a way way better um it's the idea that's good it's modeled on a bit of um uh, the decline and fall of the roman empire by edward gibbon <coughs> which is a very good massive book massive set of books i've just got the first big volume one and two i think penguin one um it's very chunky, but very well annotated. If you if you're a passion for history, um, read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Mm. So it's a big influence on that and so on. But yeah, I, I remember I thought the Mule um, is pretty good in in the Foundation. And um, Christopher, there's an argument that Dune is a response to Foundation. So the two the two books actually, I'm, I'm kind of where Asimov was going. I think as we go into the eighties with both writers. Um, foundations kind of being built up by Asimov. We've got other things. Clark's got other things, but he's building his 2001 universe. Herbert's got his June universe, but also has other things. And Heinlein's the only one who's kind of uh, hippity hopping about and doing different things, I think, of the big four, you know. Um, but Asimov's foundation represents um, a chaos to order perspective. And the idea um, that June is a response to it as an order to chaos perspective of empire. And that, um, let me just get it for you. Uh, Christopher, if you actually, depending on how big a nut of a uh, Frank Herbert fan you are, if you want to read all about this, this, I've shown a few people this before. This is Chaos Theory, Asimov's Foundations and Robots and Herbert's Dune, the fractal aesthetic of epic science fiction. By Donald E. Palumbo. That's your book there. If you're a if you're a big fan of Foundation and Dune and want to see that comparison, it's really good, really good. Um, I I, I reference this work uh, a fair bit. Um, um, I don't know if you can see my copy, but it's I've annotated the heck out of this. Uh, I've got all sorts of stuff scribbled all over this book. Um, if you're interested in chaos theory, the mon and the monomyth as a fractal pattern. As a, um, it's really good. Um, I don't know how I, I don't know how hard this is to get, to be honest. It's published by um, Greenwood Press, Westport, Connecticut, and London. Do do do, publishing. Do do do. Copyright two thousand two by Donald E. Palumbo. <coughs> so I imagine you should be able to get um, I, I think I picked mine up and. Second hand online, not too, not without too much difficulty. So there we go. If you're into the whole Asimov psycho history, the Foundation series and June series, that that's a book that has a really good good comparison of the two from a very particular point of view. Let's just catch up with you folks. Randon, isn't it a narrative device to reduce Paul's presence just so that the narrative can have, can have tension? <coughs> yeah, it's it's got to have tension, doesn't it? And it, it does. Now, that's one of the things we're saying, in my opinion, why Herbert's such a good writer. Uh, he, he's giving us so much, but we're not, we're, it doesn't ruin things for us. Right, goodness gracious, that's flying along here. I better do a bit of catching up, folks. So I'm going to do a wee bit of reading. And uh, let's see. Hope I haven't missed anybody's questions. Where was the last book? Foundation. Right, okay, David. Hi, David. Paul is nobility, a product of Benny Gensert's scheming going back centuries and later impressed upon by the Fremen during his time as a refugee there. From the start, from the start, he struck me as a produced hero. <coughs> mm. Very much, yeah. He, it, it's the idea of uh, all these teachers, etc., being around him. Um, and I, I think humanity, that's what the Bene Jet produce, isn't it? It's, uh, they're looking to produce people, certain types of being. And kind of, I think that backs up a wee bit with... Um, Samuel Butler's ideas on the evolution of machines and mankind and what he thought of Darwin's theories of um, evolution by means of natural selection, that it produced a very mechanistic view of the universe, David, I think. So, yeah, he, he is, he's a very, 
Um, in the book, he's kind of, you know, carefully, he's, he's being molded, isn't he? Uh, to be a kind of mentat duke political leader. Um, that's not what he ends up being, you know, I suppose all of those, but it's a different, he becomes a different type of hero for a while. But um, yeah, he, he's a very carefully, very carefully constructed hero in terms of the writing as well. Christopher says, uh, in terms of Leto being the ultimate mentat, I think his prescience could certainly be explained as a less mystical ability than an analytical one. Hmm. Yeah, and we were kind of told a bit about the, I mean, uh, his prescience could certainly be explained as less mystical than analytical. It's less that than that. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. And we, we kind of get told that the, the God Emperor's face kind of isn't really, that's not where his brain is. And his brain is, it's described as in terms of like a network of nodes, isn't it? Um, essentially the God Emperor's network <laughs> in terms of brain power. Um, so yeah, it, again, that evolution and it, possibly the physical structure uh, a transformation of merging with the worm that that does that to his brain as well. That's possibly why you get that level of um, almost, almost absolute, absolute, absolute prescience. Sorry, if you see what I mean. Whereas Paul's got one brain, he the God Emperor is networked. Um, it, it's it's mentioned kind of when I think one is it what somebody's trying is it one of the Duncans is trying to kill him and I think he points the las gun at his face or something and. Um, this, I think just before this particular worm kills the Duncan or something, all this this run, you know, fool, he doesn't even know that my my brain is no longer there. That kind of thing, if I if I can remember correctly. Mm. So that, I think, yeah, Christopher, and particularly that the, his network, <laughs> his brain is networked. Wouldn't it be great if you could have a spare brain in each of your kneecaps or something? That'd be fantastic. <laughs> boost your boost your main brain. Dean says, uh, all okay, all quizzes are. Abilities are perfectly explainable within the junior universe. There's nothing messed about them. Yeah. Um, Rand Dominic says the whole ecological notions brought up in June were wiped clean when the honored matters were melting plants down to balls of molten slag. Absolutely. Well, that's kind of it. Right? Uh, the, the ecological lessons end. Uh, maybe that's the point. Just Arrakis is boom. Uh, terms obliterated, I think. Um, yeah, so that's that 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 was the thing that surprised me the most, randomity. Um, I'm not too sure why. And it's again we've no last seven, but but why drop the ecological message like that? It, it, um, especially when it's such a driving force in your life, if you see what I mean. Um, David says I agree. I, I think there may be something mystical from our own point of view to explain the function of presence. But as an understood thing, thing, thing veiled in mystical description, um, thing with an explanation which we only see is attempted to be explained in terms of the mystical, was what Arthur C. Clarke talks about, any any sufficiently advanced technology, as it when viewed, uh, was it by a society that doesn't use that, something that would seem magical, like close to magic, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I can't remember the quotation, but it's a well-known quote, isn't it? Something about any sufficiently advanced technology it could be viewed as magical, or something like that. Um, no, that the, there is a there is a, there is definitely an attempt to provide a realistic um, explanation for some of these things, and I think a lot of these things are also used. Uh, I think the problem for a lot of critics at the time is that you're as much as you're getting the prescience here is probably the result of a. A person evolving like a computer to like a mentat and then etc etc and some of these abilities are amplified with drugs as well um hmm. so but everything all there's a lot of yeah everybody puts out a deceptive shroud if you see what i mean the atreides use propaganda to cover what they they kind of are um the benny Gesserit use the we're witches we're mystical you know um all things religious and mythological almost, um, to hide, to deceive what they really are. The Benny Tylax do the same thing, to hide and deceive what they are. They put out this, we're, we're dirty, we're nasty, the filthy, dirty Tylax. And they all, all of these groups always want people to believe that they're less than what they actually are. So it's about underestimation, isn't it? 
which we, we've talked a wee bit about it. Um, I've talked about how I get underestimated an awful lot, and it's something that I really enjoy. Um, <laughs> if you see what I mean, uh, it's uh, I don't deliberately do it, but it's one of those things that people just do, or they make they make assumptions or value judgments, etc. Lots of comments about this in June, um, but yeah, so it's uh, all of these groups want people to make those assumptions. They want them to underestimate them because it gives them a, an obvious strategic advantage. Um, so shrouding things in myth is a way of creating fear sometimes. Depends on the myth. Hmm. I think Lido's ability, says Christopher, to perfectly predict the actions of individuals on possibly mystical the spice is a drug that allows extra sensory perception. Uh, hmm. And the oracular spice would never really get what's that all about? <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, if you think about the effects of spice. And what it what it leads to, it's incredible. What is this? You know, so that that's got to be a big. What is space, and what does it do to the human consciousness? Hmm. That was a really bad car crash, Christopher. Um, nineteen ninety five. Got hit sixty miles an hour right into the side of my car. Bang like that. Um, and it was at a crossroads, and the local government had taken all the stop signs and the lights down, and I was in a part of London. I don't know. Just went right, bang, straight got hit. Um, uh, the entire car was crushed. Um, we, we drive stick here, so the, the gear stick was crushed. So if my passenger had been in the car, they'd been killed. And then all of that part of the car. And I, I was um, what you would call, I suppose, hyper accelerated, but I, I, the whole thing happened. And I was actually able to react and move like that and watch the car crush. And at that point, I was thought I was dead. And it stopped about there. <laughs> and then the car was pushing me and I turned around and um, there's a wall coming at me like that <coughs> and again not really I can't much I can do but I'm, I'm reacting to it all way way quicker than I should and I stopped about that far from the wall and I had to, <laughs> had to climb out of this car and there's there's if that if you can see how wide I am that's what was left of the car <laughs> uh, and it, everything just you know it's incredible but there are you know a lot of people talk about it. it's my own experience of it and I have full full memory of it and it was a, it's a very the whole thing seems to last about a, I'd say about a minute in my own memory and at the time it was over like that um, it was incredible um, <laughs> takes its toll that kind of stuff <coughs> excuse me mm. so yeah what you know all sorts of things affect the body and mind and so on but the the, the, the Milan's thing is incredible um Lily says, I don't know that Herbert made a distinction between seeing the future or seeing the path necessary to create that future. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. I'm not sure if he does either. Um, seeing the path is one thing. Yeah. Let me, let me run this in my head a little. Um, so we, Paul sees the path. Seeing the future. There's things between seeing the future or seeing the path necessary to create that future. Yes, I agree. The, um, that's right. Um, I think, sorry, you say you don't know that Herbert, Mind I think he does. That's the little nexus point within the story. And as I said, if we had perfect press, it's, it would ruin the story for us, wouldn't it? And um, the little things where things aren't, where Paul can't quite see beyond. So those, I think, yes, yeah, it is the difference in seeing paths that possibly will create a future. I'll go down that one because if I, if I don't, those are gone. He talks about this with Gurney, I think, doesn't he? He talks about the visions where he can see Gurney and where he can't. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I think he does make that distinction. Um, let's see, just catching up. I've got a lot of catching up to do. Carol says, speaking of Mentat navigators, I had this idea the other day. Mentats and navigators have two distinct kinds of prescience, with Mentats having mechanical projection calculation from data, which is only as accurate as the data and relatively easily messed with by withholding crucial data, but navigators have the so-called limited prescience, which is truly oracular, in the sense that they glimpse, what they glimpse, safe highliner paths, is highly reliable, but very fragmented and without a logical origin. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting, Carol. What's the, the difference in a Mantat and a navigator? I suppose. And if we think of the Mentats as a human computer, what is a navigator? And surely it's something very, very similar. 
I'm wondering. As much as we have the Mentats and Twisted Mentats, we don't get under the Navigators too much, do we? That's a really good point. It, and of course, how, how, I mean, navigators use the space to fold space. Um, to travel without moving, that's impressive. Do you know what I mean? Um, why? <laughs> I suppose the question I was going to ask is why bother with spaceships? It's a bit like jaunting, isn't it? I suppose, well, if you, if you can do it yourself, you just jaunt. Um, if anybody knows what I'm talking about from Tiger Tiger. Um, that's a very good, very good uh, point. It, 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 I think it would have to do fundamentally, Karen, between what's the difference between the mental the mental schools of the guild, the, the, the guild, and um, well, is the guild really a mental school? The navigators, what what is it? Because it's it would argue that it should be both. Ma um, oh, 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 oh! I know. Sorry, mental logic, isn't it? Guild is higher mathematics that's the difference i think and that's why the mentats flawed by the way badly flawed yeah if you're if you're being logical if you study logic you need you need information you need um and you can't you can't come to you know the less you have the less accurate your conclusions are going to be so maybe that's it Karen. just having a wee think about it because for in my own head i was thinking they must be both mathematical but uh, Maybe I'm wrong, guys. I'll, I'll follow the, the thread down and see what you think. But I'm thinking is that the Mentats really is the function logic. And it's the Guild is mathematics. The Guild is a school of thought, isn't it? Just remembering. That's a really good point, Karen. Thank you very much for that. I'll see what, what people think. If Guys, if you want to chip in there down below. Um, David says, I became interested in the lore of Warhammer 40,000 sometime after reading the June books. I saw many things which seem inspired by something in June. I tend to bring my thoughts on, to my games. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder is, is there a Warhammer 40k type game for for June? I know there's computer battle games and so on. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, Fremen and Sardaukar and so on. Hmm. I wonder. Is there, is, I wonder. I haven't played Warhammer 40,000 probably since 1992. <laughs> I think it's the last time, possibly 91 or 92. I think. <coughs> Excuse me. Christopher says. Um, it was more of control of society overall to achieve a goal than predicting without certainty the actions of individuals. Uh, oh, and then Karen says, and then the reason Paul and Co have proper presence is because they combine these two skills in feedback loop, confusing visions used to fill gaps in data projection. Ah, feedback loop's pretty important within the June series, uh, Karen, and you're, you're going to see that more when the next episode that we have is Leto the second, and then we're, we're pretty much have covered our hero in that sense, the major heroes in the Dune series. And then we're, we're going to be having a look at um, the ecology of, of the Dune series and um, positive and negative feedback loops. I think I was talking about money the other day as, as a system that has massive positive uh, positive feedback loops. Positive feedback loops are not good, by the way. <laughs> mm. Yes, and uh, um, Lido... Leto talks about Paul as being taking that and becoming the ultimate feedback loop, isn't that right? But Herbert trumps Asimov. He does, but, and yeah, I think he does. Um, to be honest with you, I, I like Asimov, but you can pick him up and read him. Pretty some. He's a he's a good enough writer, but he's um. Uh, I'd say Asimov's prosaic. That's the word I'll use. But his, his stories are interesting. Um, he's a good writer. His ideas are great, but his writing's prosaic and his characters aren't great. Uh, not that I can, I'm trying to think of characters from Isaac Asimov books, and the only one that pops to head, pops into my head, would be Harry Shell, Harry Seldon, and the Mule. And I don't think um, I'm trying to remember the name of the robot in the Bicentennial Man. Is it Andrew? I can't remember. Um, that's it. I can't remember the name. I can remember the stories, but um, and. I really like the robot stories. The complete robots are great. If you read them all in a row, great. You know, but yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I think these kind of thing, the best of all time, the greatest of all time, it, they should all have up until now <laughs> following that, you know. But I think Herbert does trump Asimov. But I tell you, I, I think I've read more Asimov than Herbert. Um, and that's, the good, that's the thing I suppose about 
these guys that are ideas machines that churn out these stories. Um, Asimov's got some crackers. If anybody hasn't read Nightfall, I'd highly recommend it. Um, I kind of there's an event in Northern Ireland that kind of reminds me of Nightfall every year. Um, but it's a great story, and I actually have, I think I was saying this. I have Nightfall too here, but I haven't read it. Um, Nightfall's about a planet that, if I can remember correctly, I think has seven suns or something like that. And all of them go into eclipse once every couple of thousand years. And the society, so the society that's there is uh, basically in permanent light for 2,000 years. And then they get one night of unbelievable darkness. And they don't know what darkness is. And they go mad and basically burn everything in their society to get light on this one day. And so it's, a, it's about a re repetitive cycle of destruction caused by a particular set of... Um, stellar circumstances if you see what I mean. It's a really good book. Uh, the kind of the story follows kind of people trying to figure out what, what the night of darkness is. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um I think the foundation series, as I said, I haven't gone into the it's the original foundation trilogies all I've read. And um yeah, I, I kind of, um, at the time when I suppose Asimov was writing those other, the rest of his foundation books, I was kind of interested in more, more complicated writers, I suppose, you know. Let's see, randomly says, presence in June is done by predicting the most likely path. Yeah, oh, hang on, moving on, I'll see there. Uh, based on making computational mental calculations, drawing from an enormous bank of data of ancestral memories and heightened awareness. That's a good, thank you. you that was very succinct, randomly. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how to put things when I'm sitting talking to you. I have to do a lot of uh, verbal dancing, I suppose, is the phrase I would use. And trying to think, there's a lot of com strange language and stuff in, in the June series. Dean says, um, the Arthur C. Clarke idea is the key. The Kwisatz Haderach can be rationally understood by a trained elite, but the rest are victims of the missionary or protective. Jesus, dog, you must have been shook. <laughs> Oh, there. Um, hmm. What happened there today? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. But uh, Arthur C. Clarke is the key. What is it, Hanarak? I see what you mean, Dean. Yeah, it's there's a level of um, where everybody's elite, pretty much, except within the Fremen Society. But then again, who we who we look at really within the Fremen Society are its elites. Um the whole point is, yeah, everybody that these people kill, Paul, all of them, they're all, they're all, they're all great killers. Um, there would be people like us, the ordinary Jews, if you see what I mean, and the uh, just the ordinary men and women and kids. Um, <laughs> must have been shook. Are you talking about as a child or something? <laughs> oh, the car crash, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was not a pleasant experience. Um, I was meant to be driving through Europe the next day. <laughs> Fortunately, the car insurance kicked in, but um, we were able to get it. And the, the, the next day after that car accident, um, Dean, I was, that's the night I'll say you remember certain things in your life. The next day after that car accident, I was on the boat from, uh, was, it, was it Harwich to the Hooker Hall, and that's where I saw Judge Dredd. And I was not in a good mood, if you can imagine. I just nearly been quite badly killed and just before that accident by the way i just dropped off my passenger uh so it was just so lucky um not a scratch on me not a scratch a week later in paris i was puking my guts up and had bad whiplash uh, and uh it was not a good situation <laughs> but it, it, yeah i kind of it was not good but very very lucky very very lucky and if that's the if, yeah, if you walk anyone you can walk away from and I hadn't had another car accident, by the way, in over 20 years. And some guy drew just, I bought a new car uh, oh, it was several years ago. And, and uh, was, I suppose it would have been 22 years after that accident. And uh, some guy just drove into me and gave it a wee scratch. And I just, if that's the only accident I have in 22 years, uh, happy days, I'll take it. Yeah, but yeah, very much. I got hit by a Volvo um, right into the middle of the side of the car. So Volvo's like tanks. Uh, ridiculous. <laughs> He's don't you must be sure. Miles Teg ancestry confirmed. <laughs> uh, da -da 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 -da. Right, catch up with your uh, 
comments, folks. Let me see. I'm getting there. Um, the reason I thought Man Karen says the reason I thought Mentat Navigator prescience must be different is because Mentat projection based on available data is clearly not sufficiently reliable for safe, safe space travel. <coughs> mm. I think I talk about it somewhere in the evolution chapter. It's got the nature of, I think that I mentioned the idea of galactic drift and stuff like that. Oh, here we go. So, sorry, I'll just read this all as a thread, Carol. The reason I thought Mentat Navigator prescience must be different is because Mentat project projection based on available data is clearly not sufficiently reliable for space, safe space travel. So whatever lets navigators see safe interstellar paths must be completely reliable as a contrast. Otherwise, the guild could just use Mentats. And if the navigators were basically just Mentats overdosing on spice, then I feel like they'd be too close to being Kwisatz Haderach like which Edric doesn't strike me as anywhere close to. Yeah. Shook. <laughs> Um, if, if, oh, if you're from Northern Ireland, you know what it reminds me of. <laughs> the car crash, right? Mm. <laughs> there you go. Mm. <laughs> that was in London. Dear, oh dear. I don't know if anybody's ever seen our, our We Have Road Safety adverts in Northern Ireland that are absolutely horrific. Um you know, they're, 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 they're something else that needs to be... They're like little mini horror films. Um, but they're very intense, full on, and just... <laughs> yeah. oh dear. Travis Price says, hello there. Hope Hey there, hope I haven't joined the party too late. Not at all, Travis. Um, we're going to run to one o'clock tonight, folks, if that's okay. That's another half an hour or so. <coughs> so we're setting up and roll carding it up because our heating's broken. And we're getting it fixed tomorrow, so... <laughs> so, though, happy to sit and chat away. Travis, uh, we're talking about all things to do with Paul Atreides. Uh, June, the June series, um, these the video that we had tonight covered um, Paul all the way through up to Children of June. So if you've got any questions or comments, fire away. Um, let us know. Same goes for anybody else. But, yeah, it's interesting what Karen was saying. I think that there must be uh, something to do. I, yeah, I think it's logic mathematics. Um Hmm, possibly. Must check that. I must have a look at the Mentats again. Rand Dominic says, wasn't JG Ballard obsessed with car crashes? Well, we've got crash, don't we? Um, if you haven't seen that film. <laughs> uh, as, yeah, I haven't read the book, um, actually. I've, I've read a good bit of JG Ballard. I've read a chunk of his stuff from the 60s and 70s. But I haven't read Crash. Um, but I have seen it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to have a James Spader theory. I don't know. <laughs> Is that certain films required James Spader? Um, who, who, who's very good, by the way, but I, I used to have a certain films turn up and they tend to be controversial at the time. And I, I you tend to find James Spader in them, <laughs> if you see what I mean. And I often thought about the casting calls for those, like, uh, who can we get who's a. And it's always James Spader. <laughs> uh, put it this way, if you watch James Spader and Crash, you'll know what I mean. Um, I suppose, what's the other films that James Spader does like that? But it, um, Secretary would be one. Um, is, it, is it Sex, Lies and Videotape? Is that something like that? They're, they're, yeah. don't know if you get what I'm talking about. <laughs> but James Spader and his younger, younger career, you know. Um... <laughs> Karen equals Mentat equals logic, navigator equals mathematics plus spice. Uh, the quiz at Sadrak, therefore, equals logic uh, plus spice. Then, ah, excellent. Thank you, Karen. That's what it is logic. Um, mm. See, lo logic, depending on how you teach, I teach maths. Um, I generally teach mathematics as a language, um, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> Um, which is which is always interesting. I, uh, it's one of those things that I always um, explain to my, you know, the parents and my pupils whenever they come, like, a bit of bother with maths. And I go, oh, great. No problem, sit down. We'll sort out things out. And I explain that I teach maths as a language, which I do. And it is a language. Um, and logic is a linguistic thing too. Um, and I, I kind of got my computer logic and I got my classical logic, if you see what I mean. I'm sure I've got a big book on logic here. Here you go. If you want to, hang on. Oh, 
somewhere. There we go. Uh, well, I don't, I don't come across as very live long and prosper, do I? <laughs> um, this is a good book. Let me see. I don't have the author's full name on the front, but it's H. W. B. Joseph, who's a fellow and tutor of New College, Oxford. This is from uh, Oxford Clarendon Press, 1906. Uh, introduction to Logic by Joseph. That's a good book. It's a big book. It's an old book, but I'm 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 sure there's probably lots of modern works and stuff on it. But um, it's really good. Well, it's um, yeah. Think of its time and place, I suppose. <laughs> Oxford, but uh, yeah, very detailed book. Um, there's all sorts of stuff on that. Um, you find it all, a lot of it in the Greek world as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Spader was great in Stargate, yeah. I like, really like James Spader. I think he's excellent. Um, but myself and my wife, we really like him. And, uh, oh, what's it called? Boston Legal. Boston Legal is very, very good. Um, I really like, we really like Boston Legal as a show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think he's brilliant at that. I, I, we saw a bit of the what is it the the blacklist is that for a wee while but I lost track of that but uh, yeah good in Stargate there, there's a there's a science fiction film I saw him in with um, I'm trying to remember it was kind of like a wee sort of maybe straight the video was it Supernova or something like that uh, who was it was that with was it James Spader and Angela Bassett or something like that I think let me have a wee look. Um, do, do, do. That's very quickly, if I can remember it. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba. Well, sort of straight to video B movies, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if any, I can't see it here actually. Maybe thinking on a different actress. Oh, no, I'm not. There you go. 2000s, actually. There you go. Film Bassett appeared in that year was Supernova. There you go. My memories. James Spader and Angela Bassett. There you go. Supernova. If anybody hasn't seen that, it wasn't too bad. Um, yeah, would have been a kind of straight to, I think, straight to video. Yeah, Supernova. Yeah, that's the one. P. Walker says, hi, P. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, I, I, my, I never really got into Stargate for a long time. Travis and would, uh, would you believe my mom got into it and I <laughs> and I, I was just because because it was uh, and I'm, I'm a classicist not an Egyptologist by the way but um, as much as I kind of have a I have a bit of a nosy into the ancient Egyptian world so um, I kind of was a bit hmm. <laughs> and I ended up my mom watched it and I watched the episode with uh, where relives the same day every day the Groundhog Day one and I quite enjoyed it and I thought I'll give this a go. Actually, I started watching them all, and yeah, got through all of the Stargates. Uh, they were, you know, and was quite surprised to see them grab a lot of the Farscape people in the last two series. So yeah, I, 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 one of those things that I thought mm, it's not for me, and I re really enjoyed it. It was good fun TV. My mum liked it, so that's that's a, that's a rare example of my mother getting me into something into science fiction. <coughs> Excuse me. Grimdark Elven Loremaster, back from the gym late. Hope I didn't miss too much. Ah, we're chatting away, Grimdark, as always. So fair, we've, we've had some pretty good and some pretty interesting ideas tonight, actually, Grimdark. Um, but we're, we're on all things kind of Paul Atreides with uh, Melange. Somebody said there, i got to get me some Melange. I don't, don't know about that. Um, God, I would love to get my hands on some spice. <laughs> Oh dear, your withdrawal would be fatal, team. <laughs> so there we are. We just had we were just I had a wee bit of a rant, or not a rant, it was a, a bit of an amusing amusing about uh, James Spader. It was it was always to do with the, the characters that he plays in those three films. They're they're a particular type of sleazy, if you see what I mean. And and I always just thought that they put out who have we what actor have we got that can can kind of do, you know, sleazy uh, James Spader. And it was it was that was the kind of joke that we always used to think about James Spader. Uh, but it's just right for those films. Uh, I said he's very, very good in Boston Legal. I love Boston Legal. Uh, so yeah, all things as usual, Grimdark, Paul Atreides, Quizats, Hadarax. We we had a wee bit of a chat about um, the difference between Mentats and Navigators. 
and uh, and just very some you know, you know where all the threads take us here. They can go anywhere with June. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions, Grimdark, fire away or any comments. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> I must take some more fluids from my throat here. Uh, Rand Dominic says Benny Gesserit training of mastery over the mind and body were key for a Kwisatz Sarak to control and utilize the benefits of the spice. A navigator doesn't have that. Mm. Yeah, and it's also that training, randomity, that um, allows the Kwisatz Sarak, the person that's going to become the Kwisatz Sarak, to survive the uh, the water of life. Because it's that prana bindu, really, isn't it? That It's that level of molecular, the ability to go inside your own mind and body and control things right down to your molecular level. And that's really what, that's really the test of the spice agony, isn't it, as well? If you can go in and change the molecule of the poison, uh, you're okay, you know. Hmm. Uh, Scott, well, hi, Scott, says, X developed technology that was capable of full space navigation, but it was inferior to the guild navigators. X equals logic plus miles. Mm. Is is that Scott? If that's in the um, the the Brian Herbert, Kevin J. Anderson ones, I'd be a wee bit oblivious to that. I'm afraid. Um, I'm not sure if it is. But yeah, it's it's. Um, and just back to what uh, what you were asking, Grimdark. We were kind of talking about almost thinking for a minute that both schools were mathematical, but we we're saying that the 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 the, the mentats are really focused on logic. The guilds more higher mathematics. Um, and we're, as Scott's pointing out, if X developed technology, what would we were kind of going what equals what equals what to get what combination, you know? Um, so yeah, X equals logic plus miles. Ah, but the, if if they were doing that, then that's the thing. Would they be violating the, the great convention? I don't know. But suppose yeah, at the end of the day, the whole the Xian ships, yeah, I'm. I'm catch. I'm rereading Scott um, the June series at the moment. I've read last time I read it was about ten years ago, so I'm just through, just getting towards the end of the first June book at the moment. So, um, but yeah, uh, I'm not too sure if that's from the June or that. But it's an interesting. Yeah, what is the difference in these guys? Uh, PP, we were just talking about a James Spader and Angela Bassett uh, science fiction film, and I thought it was from the '90s. It's from the year 2000. It's called Supernova. I would call it a kind of straight to video in those days, but it was. Uh, but it was uh, quite good. Dean McKenna says, tut, tut, doc, first you get into Stargate, then you watch it and realize it was shitely private. Yeah, I'll go with that. That's a good, that's a way of put it. I enjoyed it. Um, not everything has to be, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not everything has to be of tip-top quality or anything. I, I'm very happy in the gutters, uh, uh, as uh, Frank Herbert would have put it. Uh, I like all kinds of stuff, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Entertained is what you want to be when you're watching TV, isn't it? it doesn't, everything has to be absolutely tip top perfect. Or it's a great universe, the Stargate one. It's well thought out, and it's, it's a very enjoyable TV show. There you go. I've got my mum to read all the gym books. <laughs> she really enjoyed them. Carol says, "Do the books ever imply that the navigators themselves serve as the method of travel?" I understood it was as the guild using some technology that works without navigators. The navigators just make it safe. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the Holtzman. Uh, Paul P. Walker said that the Holtzman effect is used for space travel, but the navigators were needed to make sure the trip could be made. So um, that's quite interesting as well, guys. We were talking about the appendices of June, um, and it talks about space travel is mentioned. In, if you have a wee look at what it says about space travel, it is quite interesting. But yes, they're Holtzman engines, as uh, P. Walker says, as far as I know. The Holtzman, we, we have a chapter on the Holtzman effect on the evolution of uh, Ixian technology uh, that goes we, a few days back there. Um, so, yeah, you have, hmm, it, yeah, it's got something to do with the engines, but it's not explained, I don't think. Um Dean McKenna says that, Karen, the Holtzman drive is well understood, but without Navigator, one in ten ships go missing. Ah, right. <coughs> yeah, I think there's something in there about that, guys. Back in the evolutionary se section that we looked at last. Uh, I, th I remember that, Dean. That's, that's correct. I think there's something that ships go missing or something. Um, hmm. So it's got, got something to do with, I think, predicting. 
I think in my one of my videos it says it's also to do something. I assume that's got something to do to do with the nature of galactic drift, if you see what I mean, and that that's what the navigator brings to the party. Uh, hmm, it's interesting, isn't it? Carolyn says the 1984 movie kind of made a lot of people think the navigators themselves do something on the technical level. Um, I I kind of with with the June thing and and. David Lynch is when I kind of thought that it was kind of spitting out some kind of well, it's, it's not, it's like a navigational field, isn't it? The things it's spitting out are kind of words, isn't it? But it, it seems like it's just almost like something kind of em, emitting and washing over. And the, the, I got the idea that it created some kind of amplified field and then just the thing had moved and it just appears where it's, uh, I don't know, it's but it's not everything is explained. And, and the Holtzman effect, the, the the history that Herbert gives and explanations for it are kind of an underlying that they work in a few different levels and that evolutionary as a piece of technology, they create all sorts of problems within the universe that are a result of the existence of the Holtzman field. Um, so the shields, for example, is what creates a knife culture. Um, hmm. Travis Price says, I'd love to get my hands on a copy of the June Encyclopedia. No problem, Travis. If you send me a, an email to uh, sciencefictionstation at gmail.com, I'll email you one if you're happy with the PDF. Anybody wants a copy of the June Encyclopedia on PDF, I've got it. So if you'd like a copy, send me a proper email out though, uh, and put in June Encyclopedia in the subject heading, and I'll send you a copy. Um... Uh, yeah, Travis, there's mine's there. Um, I don't know if you can see it. But uh, I never thought it was particularly hard to get. Mine's in pretty good nick. Uh, I've had this for ages. Um, I don't know how much people are paying for it, but mine's three pounds. <laughs> uh, it's a very, very good book. For the for the June fan, it's incredibly well done. It really is. It's um, And it is a piece of fan fiction in a sense, but it is also an encyclopedia. And you get all sorts of stuff in it, you know. The detail in it's incredible. Really good illustrations and things. Um, but I, I understand it's getting hard to get. But um, if anybody wants a PDF, um, the Herbert Foundation shut that book down quite harshly, I think. <coughs> um, uh, it's what I would call a low point in the kind of the universe, if you see what I mean. But if anybody would like a copy, or honestly, I, I'll if you send me an email to the station there at that address, um, I will send you a PDF. Uh, -bum -bum. Just catching up. Nav uh, Carol, the navigators. Sorry, navigators serve the purpose of a navig computer as a computer couldn't be used. Traveling through hyperspace isn't like dusting crops, you know. <laughs> Very good, Rad Domini. P. Walker says Quinn over at Quinn's ideas managed to get a good copy. Uh, yeah. wonder how much you paid for it. <laughs> Grimdark Elven Loremaster says, I'm surprised Quinn has never referenced you. Highest tier of fan fiction since uh, Grimdark, uh, um, I did a couple of things that I think have, have I think I maybe have been, a, yeah, a couple of things that I've done on my station that I think Quinn has had a wee kind of go at, and he got a couple of things not right, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I'll have to comment on the station, but um, yeah. Um, I think he watches me, but he doesn't interact in any way. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I like Quinn's channel. It's very good. P. Walker says, uh, it's been out of print since 1991, something like that. Brian Herbert doesn't want it printed. Yeah, there is a, there was a legal action um, between the Herbert estate and Professor Willis E. McNally, who's the writer of the, the June Encyclopedia. I don't know the details, but it is an attempt to shut something down and say it's not part of our property. And um, I thought it was, I don't know what, I don't um, genuinely don't know what to think about it, but I think it's mercenary is the word I would use. And I think it's a cruel thing um, because I don't know if you know this, but um, here's why I think. Um, Compiled by a professor. It, it's got a good. It's a, a 
<laughs> Had he been able to? I'll read. I'll just read you quickly what Frank Herbert says. Okay, and this is this is this is you'll know, get my opinion. Uh, here's what it says. It says um, this is a uh, Frank Herbert's wee front page piece to the the book. Uh, it says here is a rich background and foreground for the Dune Chronicles, including a scholarly bypaths and amusing sidelights. Some of the contributions are sure to arouse controversy, based as they are on questionable sources. Others round out long speculation. Specialists have had their field day here with problems, geological, biological, astronomical, and mystical, with pronunciations, major biographies, histories, and accounts of little known figures. The range of topics is Catholic. Croft reference from games for amusement to games of life and death, Cheops or Pyramid Chess to the Assassin's Handbook. The history of the financial synod which spawned Chome gets its first airing in these pages. In fact, many secrets hidden in the Dune Chronicles are answered here. <coughs> Excuse me. How did Erlan first gain and then arise the displeasure of Ganema? Who was Jihan Butler? And why does the Butlerian Jihad carry her name? What are the hidden origins of the Spacing Guild? Where did spice trans navigational techniques develop? What was Leto II's private opinion of Holy Sister Quintinius Violet Chenua? Does Cheops have something in common with the three-body problem? I must confess that I find it fascinating to re-enter here some of the sources on which the Chronicles are built. As the first Dune fan, I give this encyclopedia my delighted approval, although I hold my own counsel on some of the issues still to be explored as the Chronicles unfold. Frank Herbert's own, own words there, you know. So... <coughs> Dean saying work tomorrow late night. Take care, Dean. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so there you go. Um, I think that that's Frank's own words on what he thinks of that book. And I think that's, the, you, you know my opinion on it. I don't think it's a very nice thing at all. And for Dune fans, then if, it, it means that you can, I understand the price of that book is start, starting to go way, way up. Um, it means you're either going to spend a small fortune on a book that cost me three pounds and shouldn't cost you more than the equivalent of a tenner. You know, it's 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 really sad. I think a lot of Jun fans would like it. Um, and it is, it's you know even before it's got things like the Jun, some of the Jun tarot cards and stuff. I've used a few images from it in the videos. And it, you know, they're all the Holtzman effect and everything there. And it, it is a, it's a it's a it's a work of fan fiction, but it's a work of love, I think. And I don't think anybody who's a Jun fan, who, I mean, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia. Could have, can appreciate that. Um, if if I had written a novel like like June and, and a professor produced that based on my work, I'd be stunned. But I'd, I'd be gobsmacked. But I'd be absolutely delighted. And I think Frank was too. And um, I, I like reading it. It's um it's not part of my work because it's not Frank's work. I do mention it a couple of times, but it, it's really good. It's and um, yeah, you can't go and buy it. It's sad. It's, uh, you know, books, I don't like books that disappear out of print. There should be some effort to, you know, ensure that they survive in some way, I think. Let me just catch up, folks. Um, <coughs> much of lies read PAF. I think here it's very expensive these days, but I'm sure it's worth it. As I said, anybody wants a copy, fire me a wee email, sciencefictionstation at gmail.com, and I'll I'll respond. Put, put um, so it won't get mixed up, get a lot of mail that's not really, uh, there's comments and stuff. But just sort of won't get mixed up, put um, June Encyclopedia in the subject heading, and I'll send you a copy. Uh, ba -dum -ba -dum. No, just to catch up, uh, Laura Master says, Frank Herbert's forward in the Encyclopedia was kind of funny when he said he's the first June fan approving the Encyclopedia. Yeah, he's a fan of his own work, and I think he's a fan of that. And I'm, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a really nice thing for him to write in that. Carol says, I'd sooner consider the Encyclopedia canon than Brian and Kevin's books. <coughs> We talked about this, Carol, as well, I think, didn't we? The, there's something about the authorial voice. I, this is my my reason why I don't really... I'm, I'm, it's nothing to do with the story or anything, but what's wrong? What's the what's not right about Brian and Kevin's books? And it's the authorial voice. And I've actually said, I think, too, it's right in that. Really interesting. That, you know, you, you, you could... If you were reading this, you would almost think Frank had written it. That's what I mean. And it's it's an yeah. If you know you're if you it's a if you're a June fan, it's I think a must, an absolute must. And it's only out at a certain point, so it doesn't cover. And as I said, Frank says 
I, I leave. Uh, it's up to me to say what happens after. You know, I reserve judgment. But this is great, and um, in general, fan fiction, I suppose, I think it's got its place in history. <coughs> it's something different. Ryan hurts. Sorry, I'm going to take a drink, folks. My throat's really bad here tonight. Mm. I'm just wondering, can I spy a cough medicine here? Oh, have we got? Oh, I do. Right, give me a wee second. I'll take a slug of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Randomly says Brian Herbert considers the Dune Encyclopedia as Poinda dirt. <laughs> I didn't like the Brian Herbert books. It says P. Walker. <laughs> Travis thinks that. <laughs> Right, um, and Dean was away saying good night, etc. Uh, we'll go for another few minutes, up to one o'clock, guys. So if you've got any more questions, um, Grimdark Elvin Loremaster says the one exception Frank Herbert didn't allow his works to be referenced was when Iron Maiden wanted to reference during the song. He threatened, I remember reading that. That's right. <laughs> what was the, um, yeah. And the Dune Encyclopedia is an exhaustive yet reverent work of fan fiction, it is indeed. It, it's interesting that he didn't like that. Um, Grimdark, because oh, my hands are wrecked and I have, would you believe, childproof caps. And... Oh, there we go. No. Ah, oh, sorry, bear with me, folks. Oh, dear. That's quite painful. Right, there we are. I, have, I, I hate childproof. <laughs> my hands are an absolute mess. And um, childproof caps really are quite bad for me. Here's the wee bit of cough medicine, folks. Hmm. David says, great chat tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night, David. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. And Randomity, what you're saying, I think it's... um. Oh, hang on. Grim Dark Elvin Loremaster says, Frank Herbert hated heavy metal. <laughs> Laughing out loud. Oh, dear. I think um, Frank's just dropped heavily in my esteem. <laughs> um, I was trying to think about... Yeah, you wonder why, actually, I suppose... And then if you know much about Michael Murcock and um, uh, Hawkwind and um, songs like Bane of the Black Sword and Stormbreaker and stuff like that, bands of, uh, some bands that are around at the time really loved this stuff and they were churning out songs. And um, even, you know, some of the Led Zeppelin songs have got like mutual references to Lord of the Rings in them and stuff. Blue Oyster Cult, that's right. Murcock, I think he performed on stage. He's well in... Murcock's a really interesting guy to look at. He's in all sorts of things. He's up to all sorts. It's not just the science fiction, the fantasy of the time. It's the music, the popular. You know, he's well embedded in the, um, I'd say, late 60s, but well, the early 70s in particular. And if, for any Murcock fans, you know, that um, I said there are some songs about, we were talking about Stormbringer um, recently. And, um, yeah, there's. I'm sure there's a so song called Stormbringer. I'm sure there's one called Bane of the Black Sword as well. Um, but yeah, Blue Oyster Cult and uh, Hawkwind are, I think, I'm not sure if he's associated with any other bands. But it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah there's a lot of that going on. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. But yeah, so the, uh, as Rand Domity says, I'm just ending up with that tonight. The, the Gin Encyclopedia is really great. And, um, Quest for Tanlorn from Blind Guard. <laughs> well, I love the idea of Tanlorn. Uh, Tanlorn's a great idea. I consider Amsterdam guys to be Tanlorn. It's my Tanlorn. And uh, uh, myself and my wife holiday in, in uh, the Netherlands every year. And uh, yeah, I, I've been, I've, oh, yeah, I think I've been there every year since 1993, I believe. <laughs> oh, actually. No, no, yeah, this year might be the exception, actually. But there we go. But yeah, Talorn's kind of like this. The one, isn't it like the, it's the eternal city in a sense that it's the city that exists in all the multiverses. And all the heroes can kind of come there and interact. And It's like a chill-out place, isn't it, for the, the eternal champions? The, you know, but usually before they, they head off. <laughs> but there you go. But yeah, very, very sad about the... Um, the June Encyclopedia. I wonder how much it is going for um, these days. Um, I'm, I'm a person that doesn't. I, I don't part with books, really, at all. <coughs> Saying that, I got, well, I'll give them to people if you see what I mean, but I wouldn't. Uh, uh, but I do, have a, I do have a set of magazines that are the analogs that are the first editions of June. 
and I have been considering getting rid of them um, at some point. But there we go. I think Quinn said it runs for about three hundred US dollars from what he saw. Goodness gracious! For three hundred, well, I'll tell you what. The one one of the things. Um, I'll do a habit here. I'll tell you what. There's a if you're studying science fiction. There. Uh, there is a book that's critical to studying science fiction theory. I thought it might be around here, um, but I don't. I don't want to go sort of running looking for it, folks. Um, it's called um, *Metamorphoses of Science Fiction* by Darko Suvin, and uh, it's a really important book. If you're going to study science fiction at academic level, university, you know, degree or above, you need a copy. You want a copy of that book. And um, I couldn't get couldn't get it over here anywhere. I had to hit. Um, oh no, I could actually. So someone was selling it here for uh, four hundred quid. Uh, uh, me being a student and absolutely needing that book at four hundred pound was devastating to me. Um, but th that's when I discovered ABE, and I went on there. And I managed to get a copy of that from America, that said it was in really poor condition, and I got the whole thing over from America. Shipped and everything for the equivalent of 45 US dollars. <laughs> uh, um, um, the book's in great condition. Is that it there? Hang on. Bear with me. Uh, da -da -da. No, it's not. That's... Oh, there it is. I'll show it to you. Here you go. Oh, um, this is my, and it said it was in poor condition or something like that. This is the book we're talking about. So, um, and I'm talking, by the way, somebody was looking 400 quid for this in, in um, this would have been 2006. Uh, um, the damage on it, it's not damaged at all. It's just got a wee, um, it's got a wee ink spot up here. That's it. And arguably, I'd say it's, that's in pretty good nick. So, um, you know, just because somebody's selling something for a price, it doesn't mean you should pay them for it. But it just got me looking elsewhere. I just decided to get creative. I couldn't. <coughs> I was looking at spending out my entire book alliance on one book if you see what i mean there we go june being first published in analog is above a lot of pulp story qualities for sure hmm. price gouging book should be a <laughs> yeah i have i have me um i've got them there but uh, i've so little room for books and i have a, i have a few sort of old magazines and things um just grab them here if you like to see them but uh, it's have we got a taste oh I think something actually that I keep with them on here is a very unusual wee thing, and I don't—I haven't seen any of these others at all. But I—I uh, don't know if you've seen these before. You can see that. That's Galactic Central Bibliographies of the Av for the Avid Reader, Volume Thirty Six. This one's on Frank Herbert, a voice from the desert. This was of incredible use to me. Working bibliography by Phil Stevenson Payne. Um, um, it's kind of like a pamphlet book. It's, it's, you know, I don't know, but for anybody interested, um, there's a website here, actually. It says www.philsp.com. But the reason why I'm telling you that is whenever, I only ever got this one for Frank Herbert, but there's a whole series of them. These are all the different ones uh, on all sorts of, um, number one, Paul Anderson, there's Bertram Chandler, uh, Edgar Pangborn, H.B. H.B. Piper, William Teen, Harry Harrison, just goes on and on. It's it's almost it's a list of everyone, and they've they've put together these bibli working bibliographies. In other words, kind of every every story that Frank Herbert's published, what magazine it's in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and it's it's what you would call a um, folio, I suppose, <laughs> just stapled together, but. I, I don't I don't know where I I can't remember where I got this. It was in a second hand bookshop, and I think I paid ten pounds for it. Um, it was really really good, you know. Um, but that's that's mine there. I so I just have this this bag here. And I don't really bring them out, but I bought them for research purposes. Um, so this one's got apart from a little streak here. This is the way I bought them. Actually, this came like this. But that's the there you go. That's the first edition of June right there. That's the December one, and then that's the next one. Oh, the little January, and then the, the last one there. There we go. And that's one of the John Schoener, isn't it? 
yeah, that's a, that's one of John Schoener's pictures from June there. Is it? So that's that's the first ones there. Um, but there you go. But yeah, it's I think you know people suddenly develop an interest in something. If you have a book like the June Encyclopedia, I think because of what what the Herbert Estate has done, you know, it is very sad. And um, <coughs> I would you know that book should be on a wee, it could be rerunning again. Um, it, it, it does. It's just uh, I talk about the age of the age of greed and stuff like that. To, to actually prevent a book being published, to make so you can make money from something else, I think it's atrocious. Um, you know, they might as well have burned it. I suppose. Can I say that? Mm. It's almost like the modern day equivalent of burning books, isn't it? To shut something down so it can't be published. Gosh, went to a dark place there, but I don't. I, I genuinely, I think it's great that people can walk into bookshops and buy a book. I'm a, I'm a person that likes old books, you know. So there we go. Uh, Karen saying he's going. To, I'll just run through these, and I'm going to call it a night myself. Karen actually thinks. Um, so just to wrap up, folks, I'll just read your last few ones, and we'll say good night for the evening. Uh, Grimdark says I stalled out the 1,500 pages of notes from Frank. As I said, Grimdark, there is a there is a men, but I, uh, there is an academic work out there that I think mentions it. Um, I think if you did a search for my academic work, you might find it, as in uh, evolution, ecology, and the messianic hero and Frank Herbert's Junces. If you do that search, you'll see it's, it's to do with I can't remember it, but um, you can look at the bibliography on it, the references. It's through Oxford Press, and I, I think I know, I'd have to see it myself, Grimdark. But it, it seems to be referencing notes of the Frank Herbert estate, uh, or you know Frank's notes. It said I think there's also, but it might it might not be these. Um, you see, there's plenty of Frank Herbert's notes. If you see what I mean, um, we're talking whether they're notes to do with the new, the final book of June. That's a different matter. So I suppose, yeah. Uh, Brian claims. I mean, I must have another wee nosy into it. As I said, they weren't really available when I was a about myself but if, if if he has if they have done that then they're probably housed with a collection or a university or something you know but um it uh, yeah uh so carol says i'm going to call it now as well it's 2 a.m carol it's 1 a.m here all the very best and thank you for joining us uh ram dominic says a great discussion everyone uh and grimdark elvin lore master brian claimed it was a 30 page outline for june 7 ah i will have a wee nosy into that but a 30 page outline for what they produced of two books, it's not that much, is it? It's, if an outline's an outline, that's all it was. Interesting. <coughs> well, listen, folks, um, <clears throat> I mean, some great questions and some great ideas tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, especially after the wee blip that we had last night. That kind of threw me a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we've spaced all the Nazis from the space to, from our station. <laughs> so uh, Travis Price says, thanks again for the chat. Doc. Looking forward to the next time. We'll be on tomorrow night again, folks, after our look at Leader the Second, finishing up our, our chapter on the hero, and we'll have the conclusions in that as well. And then the episode after, that's going to be the start of the big look at ecology. So, um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing you all, hopefully, if you can make it here tomorrow night. Um so this was the biggest episode. So this one's about Leto the second, and it's some of the same stuff that from a uh, previous episode. Not much though. Uh, it looks at him in a slightly different way, as as the hero, if you like, in the, the that part of that warning. So um, I hope you can join me at ten o'clock for the episode tomorrow night, and we'll be on live straight away afterwards. So once again, folks, um, I'm very long winded at saying goodbye. Under, I'll say good night. Uh, look after yourselves and take care, no matter where you are. All the very best, and thank you very much for joining me. Take care now. Bye-bye. See you later. <laughs>